Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast. Today, we're talking about personalities. And I've got one. You've got one. Hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a lot of times people feel like MCAT is my personality right now. And like, that's all I got kind of going on. Um, but we're going to spend a couple of weeks kind of talking about different aspects of personality. Um, there's a lot. This is like looking at the AAMC's outline of like, like what's going on with the stuff that you're expected to know. I think this is one of the densest section, right? Um, like sections of of what the AMC is expecting you to know. Because there's a lot of stuff here about Freud and humanists and behaviorism and social constructive or social cognitive like perspectives. And there's just a whole lot of different stuff here. So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about these different aspects of personality and these different viewpoints of personality. And so different people are going to look at um, like where personality comes from a little bit differently. And I feel like we should just start with Freud because that's like, it, that's kind of, I feel like just the default is like Freud is so big and all over the place and everywhere. And so it makes sense. We should probably like start by looking at Freud's view of it. Absolutely. And taking a step back um, to think about which, you know, what name we give to the thinking of personality and the theory that Freud specifically prescribed to and that was the psychoanalytic theory. So the psychoanalytic theory, um, we talked about Freud for two episodes about a month ago, um, but the psychoanalytic theory is all about how our behavior is ultimately coming from different components of our mind. We have the conscious component of our mind. We have these components that are subconscious and some that we, the unconscious specifically, that we don't access. And so ultimately, a lot of who we are is the result of all of these coming together, having different um, connections and interactions. And ultimately, there are, our mind is trying to minimize the conflicts between these. And so as we talked about with Freud, we had the psychosexual development, we had the id, the ego, and the superego. And so it's all about how our conscious, that pre-conscious, the unconscious melt together to make each of us individually. Yeah. And just to be clear, there's a lot of stuff going on with Freud. Like we talked about Freud in like two episodes, like a month ago. And so there's a lot of stuff going on there. But if we're talking about personality, it's really important to just like lay out the psychoanalytic overall is like they care about subconscious. Like what like there's stuff going on below the surface. So like if I went and talked to Freud and I'm like, hey, Freud, I'm having trouble at work because I feel like my boss doesn't understand what I'm good at. And they keep assigning <laughs> me things that are like I don't I'm not like particularly skilled at. And so like I'm not doing well at work, but it's because the stuff I'm doing is not the things that I'm good at. But if they just understood and like Freud would say, shut up. Not about your boss. Tell me about your mother. Right. Like that's <laughs> that's what Freud cares about. Um, according to Freud, like the problems that we have as humans, most of those problems are problems that we're not even aware of. Like we don't even realize them. They're buried in our subconscious. And so you need someone to analyze your psyche, aka a psychoanalyst, Freud being like the classic example. Um, but he's not the only one. So it turns out, um, like do kind of like go and look a little bit more about Freud. Like we we could talk about Freud just nonstop for like six months. Um, but that basics of understanding where personality comes from is big. You could do go back and watch those couple of episodes if you haven't. But another um, psychoanalyst is Carl Jung. Um, and it's J-U-N-G. It looks like Carl Jung, but it's Carl Jung. Um, and he was also a psychoanalyst. A lot more kind of like going on with the, like, you know, understanding what's going on in your subconscious. Um, but there's a couple of terms specifically that you need to be kind of comfortable with with Carl Jung. Um, Carl Jung believed in something called the collective unconscious, um, which <laughs> I got to be careful. I think this sounds a little silly, but maybe I just don't understand. Um, like, I, I understand, but like, maybe I just I'm not on the same wavelength as Carl. Um, <laughs> so looking at this, the collective unconscious is this idea that we all have some 
subconscious memories and things going on that are shared between all of our ancestors and us. And so we have this collective subconscious that we're all a part of a larger thing and that there's a subconscious kind of shared between me and you and everyone else in the world um, coming from just what happened in generations before. Um, I don't know. Now that I say it, I'm like, okay, I could maybe see there is something going on with this. Um, but it just seems strange to me that there's like a bunch of memories that I have that are <laughs> the same as your memories. That uh, maybe I'm coming at this from a very from too much of a strict neurologist, like neurology yeah, I mean. perspective, that it seems a little a little strange to me, like studying memories. But the MCAT's not gonna ask you what I think. They're gonna ask you, <laughs> what does Carl Young think? And so that collective unconscious, that idea is something that you definitely want to attach to Carl Jung. Yeah, I think what I tended to find most interesting about Carl Jung's and this collective unconscious was the idea of archetypes that essentially these collection of personalities as or not of personality of traits as a person exist collectively. And so this archetype that represents the mother or the archetype that's the child. Um, and it's I found this interesting because it's similar to what we see in, for example, in movies, right? There's always like some kind of trickster. There's always, you know, someone who is that mother personality. And it's it's one of those things where society as a whole automatically taps into that from early on. But is it actually that we are collectively have this collective unconscious that is automatic or is it you know is it because we they are roles that people just take on and that are almost necessary in different aspects of society that are so automatic that then we assume they are part of a collective unconscious so that's the my personal perspective that i yeah, thought you, about this with when thinking okay how did carl rogers ultimately carl young ultimately come up with this idea um but yeah, I totally agree with you, Phil. It definitely gives us pause, especially when we think about how we approach memories and you know neural networks today. And, mm -hmm. you know, it makes you wonder how he would have thought of it today, knowing what we know, but also imagining that a lot of um, spiritual and religious um, mm -hmm. belief systems might have something parallel to this is also just really interesting and, and gives you food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is very, very, like, I, I kind of like just want to keep diving more into it but because there's a lot of stuff there. But I think for the MCAT, just mostly understanding what this collective unconscious is in general. And like the moment you see that, you should think Carl Jung and psychoanalyst and like making that connection. There's, there's another term from Carl Jung, which is uh, individuation. Um, and so this is the process by which as we get older and we start to understand more about us, we become more individual. We kind of like that we have kind of an undifferentiated state, um, kind of think about it like from a like, biology mm -hmm. perspective. And we sort of differentiate and we become more individualized um, as we come as we get older. And like that's something that's specifically like um, Carl Jung kind of focus ha says happens in like the latter half of life. Um, and as a part of this, you start to kind of care less about other people's thoughts and peer pressures and norms, and you become more kind of confident in who you are as a person. Um, but all of this is kind of happening. Once again, a lot of this is based in this subconscious realm. And so like you just kind of become more comfortable and more willing to differentiate yourself um, and come into being as who you are specifically as an individual separate from everyone everyone else and that's in in different forms it's ultimately a running theme i think through <laughs> these theories of personality you know it takes different forms but if you think about it that that's kind of what it revolves around how are you you right right and so having you know being really clear on the specific terms associated with these theorists is important i know that we're going to talk about someone else really soon. And we were we were discussing why I might have associated, you know, in when I was studying 
I, I had difficulty associating two particular terms with the individuals. And that's because they're both named Carl. <laughs> that-, <laughs> that is a great observation. Uh, but kind of moving on to the next theory of personality that we have, it's the humanist, uh, humanistic perspective. And so with the humanistic perspective, it continues to become more individualized. And so rather than thinking about this from a collective perspective, the way Carl Jung did, it's more how does your free will determine who you are and what your behavior is, right? So you have this version of yourself that's the ideal version of yourself, and then you have reality. And inevitably, there is some difference between reality and the self that you would like to be. And that causes some kind of um, incongruence between yeah. between the two. And so ultimately, as you're progressing through life, you are ultimately trying to self-actualize, so become that better and best version of yourself. And so one of the big names in the humanistic perspective is Carl Rogers. Mm-hmm. And so Carl Rogers was really interesting um, he was friends with Freud. And so, uh, or rather that was Carl Jung, but um, you can think about how like with Carl Rogers, he, um, he, he was just an, an interesting individual. He thought about, well, he was actually born in um, near Chicago and he actually was considered, he, by psychologists, he's considered particularly influential um, in some instances, only second to Freud. And so he thought about things from uh, the perspective from the patient, the perspective from the student when he was teaching. And so he pioneered this idea of patient-centered therapy, where now instead of assuming that you could have all of the answers, you had to listen to the patient to understand what their particular perspective and their particular Um, needs were. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if it's all about free will determining an individual's behavior, then it would make sense that we would want that patient-centered therapy. And with respect to education, he had a similar thought process that it was student-centered education, which personally I find something (laughs) really important because not there's not one size fits all for treating patients, for helping students achieve their best potential. And, you know, you have to have an idea of what each individual in particular needs. Yeah. So, yeah, we just kind of stepping back, right? Like the two Carls, I got all <laughs> of them mixed up, like Carl Jung and then Carl Rogers. Carl Jung, psychoanalyst, Carl Rogers, humanist. Um, I would say Carl Rogers might be kind of like the the biggest name in humanism, um, he actually came up with the term self-actualization, which we will um, we'll kind of talk about here in a minute. But this like patient-centric therapy, this is what most people think of when they think about um, going to therapy, right? Like, you know, you're you're unloading all your stuff to Freud. He tells you to shut up and tell you about his mom or tell you about your mom. Um, that's a Freudian <laughs> slip. Um, and like Carl Rogers, on the other hand, like... I'm like talking to Carl Rogers. What Carl Rogers is going to say is, tell me more about that. Like, how does that make you feel? And I'm like, that sort of like what most people think of with therapy is kind of based in Carl Rogers view of look at the like therapy should be focused around the patient. The patient understands more about what's going on in their head than I do. It's not my job to like tell them what to be thinking about and like what information they have that I need to know. And like, kind of like, what is the psychoanalytic analytic perspective but it's more about like what's what's the patient feeling like let the patient kind of lead therapy because they understand kind of where their issues are a little bit better now the like self-actualization which is this term that rogers focused on and coined is like i i, I hate to kind of use like modern day language but like be your best self is really the idea of self-actualization. Like, what is the ideal um, self-actualized or just kind of like best version of yourself? Um, I want to be kind of careful. A lot of times in Western society, we kind of tend to think about that as the most successful. It's not necessarily what this means. Someone could be self-actualized who is a teacher, 
right? Like, a, let's say a high school history teacher, and they love teaching younger people, and they, um, you know, they like coach volleyball. And then over the summer, they take their kids and they travel across the U.S. and and they just love their life and they love every aspect of it, and they feel well rounded and they feel like they are addressing every component of what do they need to be a happy, healthy person. And all of those things are addressed. And so that's this term self-actualization, which Rogers came up with. And now like kind of humanism is just kind of built around this idea of how do you become self-actualized? How do you become your best self? Um, A big portion of that for Rogers is like you said, that like ideal versus actual, right? And so we all... Like uh, Carl Rogers kind of like looked at it kind of like this Venn diagram of like, who who am I? What's my actual self? What's my ideal self? And the more those overlap, the closer to self-actualization I'm going to be. Um, there's also like the perceived self, which factors in as well. So, for example, if I want to be a very charitable person, that's my ideal self. And I'm not actually super charitable then I'm going to start to create some dysfunction because I don't have this congruence where like what I want to be and what I am are not overlapping well. Um, so it's ideal, actual, and perceived self. You can, you can imagine scenarios where one of them is kind of out of line with the other. Like I want to be a very honest person. I actually am an honest person, but I don't see myself that way. Like that's a problem where my perceived self isn't overlapping or it's not incongruent with the rest of um, with the rest of the, the, the kind of circles there. And so, um, he's focused a lot on just kind of like understanding like how to overlap these and that leads to self-actualization. And without that, you have dysfunction. Um, and so basically you're not approaching that self-actualization. There's, there are two phrases that I frequently use, and you've definitely heard me use these, that I think actually align really well with the humanistic perspective. And it's that it's about progression and not perfection. Mm -hmm. And that a weakness is just a strength you haven't cultivated yet. Mm -hmm. And it really is all about self-actualization, becoming your best self. And I, you know, a lot of times I apply it to the MCAT specifically. But as we're talking, I was thinking about how, like you were saying, it's something that is deeply ingrained as in our society as something to aspire to and something to strive to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that just kind of stuck out at me while while you were chatting. Yeah. And I I really like that this uh, self-actualization is more focused inward than Mm -hmm. outward. It's not necessarily about achieving certain things or or, you know, getting reaching certain goals or things like that. It's about like how you view the world and how you interact with the world. And that's more where, where self-actualization comes from. Um, I feel like, at least speaking for myself, I've been in a lot of places where, okay, now we're getting like real. Um, I've been <laughs> in a lot of places in the past where I'm like, okay, once I get into med school, once I finish med school, once I, you know, like do this or do that, then I'll be happy. Um, and so Rogers kind of flipped that a little bit and says, okay, it's not it's not about what you're, achieving it's about yep. how like what's going on as you're achieving it's go- it's about what's going on with you Look, and so yeah. i like to think about that a lot more as becoming just a happier healthier human um and it's more about how i'm approaching things than what i'm yeah. getting done and i know that that is something that is probably hard for a lot of people who are studying the mcat and like i'll be happy when i'm done with the mcat i'll be happy when i get into med school i'll be happy when i finish med school um, and I think, you know, we talk about this a lot, but this process that all of you guys are going through, you need to approach it more as a marathon than a sprint. And you need to make sure that how you're approaching this is a way that is sustainable and you can be happy while you're doing it. Because I have definitely been in places and I know a lot of people have out there where their like approach to being happy is based on like achievements rather than like what's going on inside them. Um, that is, I don't mean to unload there, but that's something <laughs> that I think is really important about the Rogers perspective is, is about like what's going on with you rather than achieving. Exactly. I like you're, I just want to echo. Yeah, we we so often focus on the end goal and the end product and we forget that 
there's a whole process that you still want to be able to enjoy life while you're going through that process. You don't mm-hmm. want to have to wait until you're, you know, 45, 50 and practicing. Or for some folks that started medicine later, even later than that, to be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this next person that we're going to talk about is a name that I think virtually everyone who is listening to the podcast probably has heard, and that's Maslow. And I think that he takes it a step further. So now it's not just a matter of, okay, we need, or rather we are aiming for self-actualization and, you know, trying to think about the the best version of ourselves, so to speak, and thinking about that societal connection. But what do we need in order to be able to achieve that? And so he had this hierarchy of needs, which Finally, we have something that is aptly named. I know in the sciences, that is not always the case. And you and I have had conversations about that. But in psych, there tends to be a lot more name it as it is. And some of this will hopefully be intuitive in terms of what needs are at the bottom of our hierarchy. And at the bottom of this pyramid, they take up more space. And so starting off, the most important and basic needs that we have as people are our physiological needs. And so these are going to be food. These are going to be sleep, shelter, sex. And you kind of can't progress as a person or society, according to Maslow, without these. And I think the food, the shelter, um, being able to sleep. We had a recent podcast episode on, we had two on Mm -hmm. sleep. And so we talked about how incredibly important it is to be able to function as human beings, especially to maximize our functioning as human beings and as students. And once you have this need met, once you have those physiological needs met, you can start thinking about the next set of needs that you have. And after having these basics, you need safety. You have to feel safe in your home, in society, and you need that security to to really help you grow. Um, And so thinking about your environment and your physical body, this is where you as future physicians will come into play with also helping patients secure their health. And this is the, the next step and the next level. And after this, we need to, we, we start getting into the more mushy aspects of, of the, the hierarchy and our needs. And that's going to be feeling like you belong. And this is something that I think is where personally, I think we spend a lot of time on. And we've had other um, other podcast episodes where we talk about connections. And this is going to be an aspect where we need to feel loved and having friendships and focusing on um, intimate connections, which should hopefully ring a bell as well. And once you have you know that that sense of belonging and that you are a part of, meaningfully a part of a group, then you start focusing on your esteem. And so this is going to be your confidence. Where do you fall in society? How do you see yourself? What's your status in society? And theoretically, once you have felt like you are confident in in your status and have good confidence, then you can move on to finally self-actualization. But without all of these other layers, you can't be self-actualized. You can't have met your full your full potential, which in some way makes sense, right? Because you need those um, physiologic needs. You've got to feel safe. If you don't feel safe, how are you going to be your best self? If you don't feel connected to other people, how are you going to be that best self? And thinking about where you stand with other people. Um, and I think this is why, ha, ah, going to get into a soapbox. I will let you chat before I do that. No, no. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. Like the fact that this is a pyramid, the focus on this is like, if you are going to build a pyramid, you can't start at the top. You have mm-hmm. to build from the bottom up. And so you have to take care of these lower things. Um, and the lower things, like you said, f- food, shelter, like physiologic needs before safety. I know it sounds like weird. Um, like why would somebody like attack a, a rhino with a knife? Right. Like that would never be something you would do unless I was starving. Like I, I might actually try to do that. If I was going to like, I'm going to die if I don't do this. 
Um, I might die if I do it, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to definitely die if I don't do it. Then all of a sudden you will start to take more risks, right? Because your physiologic needs are more important than safety. Because if your needs are not being met, then all of a sudden you might act unsafe. I think about this sometimes with patients that I see or people in the real world doing behaviors that I'm like, okay, why would they do this? Um, why would they do you know this or that or different things? And a lot of times um, we see and criminality is is more often happens in the like the lower classes, um, lower socioeconomic classes. And I think it's just because it's hard to meet your needs in that socioeconomic status. And so like, yeah, I might get injured physically if I rob a store. But if I'm like, I don't have like, I don't feel like I, I can afford a house. Like I can't afford rent. Like I don't have anywhere to live. I don't have like enough money for food. I don't have enough. Like I don't have shelter. Like that's all of a sudden, like making those risks makes sense, right? Like attacking a rhino with a knife, right? Like you might get injured. You probably will, you know, robbing a sto- robbing a bank, right? Like that you're probably going to get injured in that case. And like, it's at the very least dangerous, but those physiologic needs kind of trump those safety needs. And so if you feel like you don't have your needs met, like physically, then you might be more willing to do this. And so kind of like working your way up the ladder you have to address the more basic ones before you can start to worry about the things after that. Yeah, I think ah, you it, you were along the same the same lines and along my thinking. This is why it's so incredibly important to you know as as future physicians, as future educators, some of the folks that are listening to this podcast will probably also go into public policy, into finance, kind of combining medical degrees with other degrees, and this is why attempts at equity are so important because we have so many members of our society that don't have their basic needs met. And so they're not going to reach their potential in just as individuals, right? And so we care about them as individuals. And even if someone, for whatever reason, did not care about other people as individuals, which I really hope is not the case for future physicians that are listening, I think all of you guys really do care about um, people. Even as a society, people aren't going to be contributing their full potential to society. And so so society can be losing out on so many future creative minds, creative opportunities and opportunities for growth. And so if you think about any of the major advancements recently, AI, what if the people that started building AI, you know, had not had their basic needs met? And this is now a whole field that is erupting with, yes, moral questions and also possibilities. And so... um, just thinking about that is incredibly important and working towards that is incredibly important. Having empathy for your patients. Maybe they're not taking their medications because they can't afford their That's medication. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Where- and so a lot, I've seen this so much and it's so frustrating where someone will say, oh, well, they're just being non-compliant. And it's like, OK, have you asked why? Mm-hmm. And that why question might be the the reason that they get connected with a social worker. They get some of those basic needs met and you turn around not just this individual's health, but maybe they're, you know, the breadwinner for the family. And now you've just changed a whole family's, you know, pro- projected outcome. And we can have so much more impact than what we realize by asking questions like why, by having that curiosity. And so I just needed to, <laughs> yeah. to say that because I think it's so important for the folks that are listening who have, em- you know, our, our listeners have empathy. Our listeners have that curiosity. They wouldn't be listening to this podcast if if they didn't. They wouldn't be trying to be future physicians if they didn't. So yeah. kudos to you guys and let's be the change. <laughs> yeah, that that's I was actually thinking the same thing with the noncompliance. It's yeah. very frustrating when you're like, just take the meds, right? Like I prescribed you the medication. Just take your medications every day is all I need you to do. And you won't do that. And like, mm-hmm. it gets really frustrating for you as a physician because like my, I am trying to help you and you're just not doing it. Um, but like, imagine like if there's somebody who hasn't eaten today and they're not yeah. sure where they're going to sleep tonight, like yeah. that's a bigger concern for them right now than their blood pressure. Yeah. Right. And so like they're struggling to figure out where to sleep. And like that's a much bigger problem in their daily life. And so they're focused more on addressing that more underlying need. Um, <clears throat> or like somebody, maybe not, you know, somebody who has housing insecurity, 
like somebody who is like, you know, let's say a, a parent and has multiple kids, but they're like you said, they're the main breadwinner. Um, all of a sudden they get an illness, which means that they might lose their house and yep. they might do like because they can't work and like things are are kind of changing. And all of a sudden they're like, I'm not sure I'm going to have somewhere to live. And I'm more worried about that than I am taking this medication or like uh, adjusting my diet or exercising more. Um, and so that's something to just kind of think about. Um, as physicians, honestly, we're probably not going to be suffering from like, oh, I don't have a place to sleep tonight. Right. I, I can't afford food. I can't get food like that's probably not a problem for a physician. Um, but just like you said, kind of like keeping that empathy and understanding that not everyone has that same level of security that you feel like you have. Um, and so it may be harder for them to become like just getting to the safety perspective yeah. is sometimes a win for a patient getting past those physiologic needs let alone getting to self-actualization. So a part of this is like your job as a physician to help these these people kind of progress in this in this pyramid. Absolutely. Yeah. I do want to kind of take one second. This isn't a humanistic view, but it is another term that shows up on the MCAT that sometimes gets twisted up with humanism. And that is the life course approach. Um, so I want to be clear, this is separate from humanism and psychoanalytic perspective. But I think that there's some similarities here. So the life course perspective is when you approach a, a patient or a person by looking at their entire life and kind of like what's going on. So different people are going to be going through different things at different times, right? There's not a lot of um, like the problems of, of somebody who's 15, like across society are all like there's some similarities, the, but like in what 15 year olds are dealing with versus 70 year olds, they're all dealing with some kind of different stuff going on there. But it, and so like looking at like somebody in stages of their life and like what's going on with you at this stage. Now, what's interesting is it's not just about like like age brackets, but kind of like uh, what things have happened. Right. Like if COVID occurred when you were in elementary school. That's different than if COVID occurred when you were like working as uh, like, you know, you're in like your mid 20s or COVID occurred when you're a parent. Right. And so like factoring in COVID into this or like so sociological events or like societal events, like how are they affecting this group and then that group and then this group and understanding that. Like the life course approach is trying to approach people and understanding what's happening across their entire lifetime, um, both from a societal view, from a social view, like what are the individual things of what's going on with their parents, um, but also just like across ages and like understanding all of those things and building all those things together. A humanist like Rogers or Maslow would say that these things are important to address to become self-actualized. Um, Freud would say like, oh, okay, well, COVID is going to cause certain subconscious like effects that people aren't aware of in like little kids. And so everyone, all the different personality theorists here, um, could uh, incorporate the life course approach into it. But because of like understanding, kind of like looking at someone as an individual and understanding like what things are happening, like in their lifetime, that's kind of a, like a almost, I would say, a more humanistic approach because you're looking and approaching people as individuals um, is is something you have to want to be careful for. And I just wanted to bring up that life course approach because a lot of times students kind of get that twisted around with humanism. Um, and I don't want students to, to, to have that happen. So keep in mind, life course approach is something a little bit separate, but it is kind of related to that humanism where we're looking at people as individuals, as an accumulation of different events and things that have happened over their lifetime. All right. Well, we're going to talk more about some of these other trait perspectives uh, or some of, the, some of these other perspectives on personality, <laughs> trait perspective being probably the next one we're going to talk about. Um, because there's a lot of different people's views. Like we've just talked about psychoanalysts and humanists, and it turns out there's more than two branches to psychology. Um, so you can look forward to that over the next couple of weeks. And I do think like keeping in mind the ones that we've talked about and kind of building on those and connecting it to different things is something that will be super useful. So 
Hopefully you guys are, are enjoying this. I do want to throw one last pitch out again. If you guys have any questions um, or comments, please feel free to email us, podcast at jackweston.com. Um, we love hearing from you guys. But other than that, you guys have a great self-actualized day. Um, and don't let yourself get too focused in on like achieving certain things and kind of approach things from a marathon perspective so that you can be sufficiently self-actualized. 